welcome everyone to BizHack Live, our weekly uh, informational webinars for the community about how to market your business during the time of a pandemic. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the host of BizHack Live and the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy. Um, today, we're going to be talking about free tools to find your ideal customer online in partnership with Emerge Americas. Uh, we're going to talk about tools that Facebook and Google give you that allow you to have access to an unparalleled number uh, of different uh, uh, data point and information that you can use to help target your ideal customer and grow your business. I wanted to welcome, uh, first of all, I wanted to acknowledge our season two partners, uh, South Florida Integrated Marketing Association and Miami Marketers. We're very appreciative uh, of all the work that those two organizations have done in support of marketers uh, during this pandemic and to help promote this free community webinar series. And I wanted to also acknowledge Sylvia Clark of Emerge Americas. Uh, thank you so much, Sylvia, for your trust and confidence in promoting this to your group. Emerge Americas is one of the top tech conferences worldwide, and it's based right here in South Florida. And I'm going to uh, give uh, Sylvia from Emerge Americas a chance to talk a little bit about uh, their amazing program that they have coming up this this in 2021 and the work that Emerge Americas is doing to support the tech ecosystem in South Florida and across the Americas. Welcome, Sylvia. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sylvia Clark and I'm the Director of Partnerships for Emerge Americas, a platform that connects the dots between startups, investors, higher education, corporate enterprises and government officials all for one objective to spur investment and innovation across the Americas and to help create a sustainable and thriving tech hub for the Americas in South Florida. To this end, each year we host an annual global event, the Emerge Americas Tech Conference, which convenes more than 16,000 attendees from 40 different countries. In and outside of the event, we curate content and resources for entrepreneurs, investors, and our entire ecosystem to help address the latest challenges and opportunities in tech and venture. Like most of you, the onset of the COVID pandemic forced us to rethink the tools we have in our toolbox to reach our audience. We had to pivot and build out our multi-platform offering. This meant completely revamping our overall marketing strategy with new and clearly defined digital goals, getting smarter about audiences' behavior and preferences and meeting our audience with relevant content. The use of tools, however, necessitates the recalibration of digital, uh, digital strategy, how you deal with your customers, how you penetrate markets, how you market your products and services online. These will have a strong and decisive impact on your business in the future. Crafting a strong brand proposition, understanding the rapidly changing customer habits and strategizing your marketing channels should be considered vis-a-vis -vis the use of digital marketing tools. That's why today's webinar couldn't be more timely. The magic of South Florida lies in its thriving entrepreneurial hub. We're proud to partner with Dan Gresh and BizHack Academy to continue to support entrepreneurs as we weather the pandemic together as a community. Thank, Thank you. you. Dan. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. And um, I did wanna ask you guys, you guys have pivoted uh, as well, your marketing, and your offering. Could you just talk a little bit, if you're able to, about how things have changed with Emerge due to COVID? Well, as you can imagine, um, and you know, today, I think we reached another um, terrible um, you know, mark in these, this uh, COVID with 1 million um, infected individuals in the state of Florida. So absolutely, we, we've had to pivot in, in, in terms of trying to provide a, a way for our community to, to communicate. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing is providing uh, a digital platform and a media platform um, for our, our, our clients and our customers to be able to communicate their message um, to, to, South, to the South Florida entrepreneurial community and ecosystem. So, you know, one of them is our insights report, which would be, which is going to be published next week. And, and that is sort of a report that, um, 
uh, takes the temperature of investment and innovation in the community and in the region. And so um, you will see that coming out next week. There are opportunities there um, for marketing purposes with thought leadership and advertising. Um, as well as our weekly newsletter. Uh, and with our weekly newsletter, we're providing opportunities for folks to, um, uh, you know, for our customers to, to have not only advertising, but again, thought leadership, um, you know, company features. Um, we're also using our social media um, platforms and, um, and networks to, to help um, our clients, um, you know, manage and, and promote their brands in the community. So those are some of the things that we're doing. And you, you should follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, um, so that you can see some of the campaigns that we're running for some of our customers. That's amazing. And uh, how about the conference itself? Um, how has it forced you guys to kind of rethink what it means to hold a conference when the in-person component is so critical to it? Um, well, you know, we definitely want to have an in-person um, event. Um, I mean, the, the feedback that we have gotten from our partners is that um, there's just no um, other way to have the best return than to just meet in person. But some of the things that we have done um, is, is, is um, collaborate with partners like you, like BizHack, yeah. and, and have these, um, these types of webinars, whether they're instructional or, um, you know, their interviews with some of our um, you know, some of our, our, our sponsors or, or companies that are providing resources and technology in the, um, in, in the community. So that's, that's one of the things that we're doing in the meantime is just really partnering with folks like, folks like you um, to do some webinars. Absolutely. And, you know, do you have any advice that you've learned from working with a lot of startups who've been forced to pivot, um, you know, things have changed so much uh, in the world uh, and in terms of not just about marketing, but also the need for greater efficiency in the product or service offerings. Um, do you have any um, examples of somebody that you've come across or any advice that you might give that you've gleaned? Uh, and sorry to put you on the spot like this, but it's just such an amazing opportunity. Someone who has a kind of bird's eye view of the tech ecosystem. I would love, you know, just your thoughts on, on how uh, businesses can adapt, startups can adapt during this tough moment. Well, um, honestly, we have um, participating, participated in several um, events, virtual events um, with the startup community and with the investment community. And, you know, Smart, uh, startups and small businesses are hurting. Honestly, just businesses in general are hurting. So, um, you know, some of the uh, advice that, um, especially in the investment community, is just to, you know, you have to pivot. You have to be able to, you know, look at your market and see how you can be relevant in, the, in, in these times uh, and how you can continue to thrive during these times. You know, and another another um, advice that I've heard is continue to look for funding, especially as you pivot. You have opportunities, um, you know, to 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 um, raise funds um, for new business models. And honestly, while all of this is really terrible, it also showcases new opportunities that you never even thought about. So, uh, and I think all of us are forced to be more creative and strategic as a result. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It's, it's really been um, kind of an extraordinary moment um, for the entire business ecosystem to really think hard about how we market ourselves, how we promote ourselves, and, and frankly, how we serve our customers. And, um, you know, one thing that we are noticing are that those businesses that adapt quickest uh, are actually, um, in some cases, doing better. Uh, despite the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, there is, there is hope. Uh, you know, we talk about this, but the idea that in opportunity, uh, in crisis, there's also opportunity. Mm -hmm. I agree with that 100%. Wonderful. Well, thank you again so much for your um, incredible support of BizHack, uh, your, uh, it, you know, just your friendship as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I've loved um you know, getting to know you, getting to know your daughter, you know, getting to know the entire Emerge family. And, you know, BizHack is a family too. And, and we're really um, very grateful that such an important organization as Emerge Americas would uh, partner with us. So, so thank you very much.
We thank you. We're very, very delighted with your uh, partnership. Wonderful. All right, so let's get to it. Um, today, we're going to talk about free tools to find your ideal customer online. Uh, this is a very interactive session. Um, and uh, so I see Andre asked a question in the chat. Um, it, it's, it's a little bit uh, off topic, so I won't directly address it, but I did wanna alert you all to the chat um, because we're gonna, you will be able to ask questions based on the presentation, as well as interact with some of the um, interactive elements of the presentation. Uh, and so please open up the chat. I'll be monitoring it in real time. Uh, I've given this presentation a number of times, and so I'm able to kind of multitask and, and address your questions as they come. So today's session is about helping you understand um, how the marketing concepts of audience segmentation and targeting translate into the digital realm. You're gonna learn free tools to find your ideal customer online, the kind who buys, tells friends, and comes back wanting more. And we're gonna show you how to use the five pillars of digital success to validate your product market fit and attract new customers. Um, Les Rubb asked, uh, I'm from Canada, will your methods work up here? My belief is that if Canadians are people, then yes, they will. Marketing is people to people. It's not B2B, it's not B2C, it's not specific to one city or country. Uh, the, the approaches that we're gonna talk about here are time-tested approaches to digital marketing, whether or not you live in Canada, the United States, or like one of our students who's in Pakistan. So many of you know me, but my name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy. Uh, spent 15 years as a journalist before I became a digital marketer and then more recently an entrepreneur. Uh, I went to Princeton, got a master's at FIU and I'm a Fulbright scholar. But more importantly, the business that I started in 2017, BizHack Academy, has been recognized uh, as a top startup by the Miami Herald and has been accelerated by programs uh, funded by Goldman Sachs, the Knight Foundation, and Entrepreneurs Organization. We've partnered in addition to with Emerge to some of the top organizations uh, from the uh, Broward College to FIU to the Idea Center at Miami Dade College, Public Relations Society of America, and of course, Emerge Americas. We've had more than 600 businesses go through our premier program, the Digital Marketer's Edge. And at the end of today, I'm gonna to share with you a, a wonderful offer uh, for all of you, uh, to those of you who are interested in really pursuing this in depth with coaching through our five-week program, the Digital Marketer's Edge. We have, those businesses have included some of the largest companies in the United States, such as Ryder, NBC Universal, and Royal Caribbean but we really specialize in the smaller businesses, the micro enterprises, um, such as Ascendant Studios, uh, a small dance studio in Doral. And, and like Sylvia said, for folks like Ascendant Studios who rely on in-person classes for teenage girls, this is not a question of growth. This is a question of survival. Um, what's happened right now with COVID has endangered many businesses like his, storefront businesses, businesses like Emerge that rely on in-person contact. And so um, you have to adapt to survive. And if you do survive, you'll come out on the other end in a less competitive marketplace because a lot of your competition will have gone away, to be frank. Uh, studies have shown that about one quarter of small businesses have shut down as a result of COVID. So the uh, level of devastation to, uh, to small businesses is uh, absolutely devastating. Um, and those of us who do pivot, those of us who do adapt to survive, uh, those of us who make ourselves more efficient will be much better positioned for the economy that emerges post COVID once these vaccines become widely distributed. So BizHack uh, really takes startups and small businesses and we show them how to generate revenue through advertising. Uh, in 2019, as a collective, they spent $17,000 in ads, generated half a million dollars in incremental revenue. That's a return on their investment in advertising of 29 to one and the course paid for itself. 
So let's talk about the foundation uh, of digital marketing, the five pillars of any digital campaign, whether it's an ad, an email campaign, even frankly, if it's a flyer or something that you put up in your store. First, you need to est establish your campaign objective. Next, you need to find your ideal target audience. Then you need to drive action with an irresistible offer. You wanna then capture them with a thumb stopping video, and then you wanna generate clicks with a compelling message. We call this the BizHack lead building system. And the lead building has five pillars. Now today we're gonna to focus on one of these pillars, find your ideal target audience. And we're gonna talk about free tools that you can use to find your ideal target audience. If you're interested in more training around the other pillars of digital campaigns, I'm gonna to talk to you about at the end, uh, an amazing grant funded course that we have going right now. Um, some of you may even be participating in it. I know Steve Harriman. Uh, if you guys, uh, Jane Moore, nice to see you. Um, if you wanna put in the chat, those of you who've been participating in the grant funded course that we're doing in partnership with Pinecrest, please go ahead and, and, and give a shout out. Um, those of you who aren't aware of it, I'll talk to you about how to sign up for that. It is uh, free of charge as a community service paid for by the CARES Act. Um, and it's another way in which BizHack is trying to give back to the community. We've had more than a thousand people register and sign up for that class and it's been featured in the Miami Herald and a lot of other publications as well. Um, thank you for the kind words, uh, Janine and Jane, I appreciate it. Thanks, Denise and Serena Milagros. Great to have you be a part of that. Okay, so for those of you who are taking that class, some of this is gonna be review, but there is some new material here as well. When you think about defining your target audience, the first thing you need to do is you need to segment or divide that audience into knowable groups. In marketing speak, we call this process segmentation. And there are a couple things to be to keep in mind when you're doing segment in, a segmentation of your potential ideal customer. First, there's the world of possible people who could buy your product or service, and then there's your ideal customer. And you really wanna focus your efforts, your, your strategy around your ideal customer. And we'll talk about what is an ideal customer. When you think about your ideal customer, Go ahead in the chat and tell me when, like, how do you, how would you describe your ideal customer? What are their characteristics? What persona, if you will, do they have? What, how do you, how do you think about who your ideal customer is? And by an ideal customer, I want to talk, I'm talking about somebody who you love to serve who pays you well and on time, who really gets and appreciates what you're trying to do, who is in many respects, the customer that you cre had in mind when you started your business or the customer that you discovered along the way. For example, I love the entrepreneur with a growth mindset, the entrepreneur who sees every piece of adversity as an opportunity to learn, who sees every failure as a chance to get better. The type of person who falls down and then gets back up. That adventurous soul. I love that kind of entrepreneur. And though I didn't really understand it when I started BizHack, what I really was doing was trying to surround myself with amazing entrepreneurs, courageous founders, you know, business heroes. So that's my ideal customer. Who is your ideal customer? Serena says they're young, tech savvy, an early adopter. Lucia says the ideal customer uh, has a, a need or pain point that my business can cater to. Absolutely, Lucia, take it one step further and now tell me who that person is. You kind of defined very nicely what an ideal customer is, but you haven't told me who your ideal customer is. Denise says somewhat uh, a 45-year-old woman, professional, somewhat tech savvy, strong and independent, single or long-term marriage, one or no kids, ambitious, wants to learn and grow, takes risks, is persistent. I love that, Denise. Denise, that's somebody who I can start to picture. Now, I know women exactly like who you're talking about. 
I live in the town of Surfside. And when I go to the kids park, I meet women like that, you know, who are there with their kids and they're talking business and they're kibbutzing with their neighbors. And so, you know, I can picture uh, that kind of professional. 70% of the people who take our five-week program are women who fit in many ways that exact profile. Milagro said, um, music lovers who value music education for their children. Excellent, right? So it's not just people who, um, like, who, who want to educate their children with music. It's people who love music themselves. Um, an office worker who spends all day in a chair, says Andre. Now I'm really curious what your product or service is. Stephen uh, uh, Harriman from Belltone Guitars, uh, a music gearhead who loves the means for creating music as much as the music itself, sees the guitar as a piece of art in and of itself. I love that, Stephen. I, you know, you're not just looking for the casual guitar player. You're also not looking for the guitar player who doesn't who doesn't have like a little bit of a nerdy streak. You're looking for like the nerdy guitarist, the guitarist who likes to the physicality of making the music, the technology behind making the music. Um, so uh, I think that that uh, you guys are starting to get a sense of how you can divide the world of possible people who buy guitars into that specific persona of somebody who's going to buy a guitar from you or buy gear from you. So the key to identifying your ideal target customer is they need to be definable. They need to be findable. They need to be actionable. They need to be profitable. And finally, they need to have growth potential. It's too expensive for you to try to reach the entire universe of people with your business. And it actually can hurt your brand if you try to be everything to everyone. What's much more effective is to narrow down your target and hyper serve your ideal customer. So let's run through what each of these items mean. Definable. By definable, that means that you need to be able to put words, demographics, interests that can be used to actually target that specific person. Definable is not the same as findable. You could identify the ideal customer, but if they're not findable, it doesn't help you. I'll give you a great example. Let's say you are a sock company and you're looking at this picture. This is all the data you have. And you say, I want to pick people who have holes in their sock. Because as a sock company, I, that's my ideal customer. Anyone who has old, holy socks and needs new socks, I'm their, they're my person. Well, the problem is that you cannot identify people with holes in their socks from this picture, from this data set. In fact, I would challenge you to find people with holes in their socks anywhere on the internet. People who have holes in their socks don't advertise that fact on Facebook. They don't necessarily search uh, on, on Google uh, for, uh, I have a hole, hole in my sock, what do I do? These are not people who make themselves readily findable. So even though they are definable, they're not necessarily findable. Actionable. Once you've defined and you know how to find them, you need to make sure that there's someone you can actually get to make your customer. So it's not just enough to say, that's my ideal customer. And we lost your audio. So actionable is really critical. You want to make sure that they're not just somebody who's going, you want to make sure there's someone who's going to actually take action in response to your, um, in, in response to your offer, in response to your product. Profitable is critical as well, especially for small businesses and startups. A lot of times we take business wherever we can get it. And we don't look to see whether the margins are actually good. A great example of this is if you have a customer who asks for a lot from you, a lot of customer service, a lot of personalization, they may not be your ideal customer because they may not actually be profitable. You may have to dedicate so many resources to servicing them that it actually doesn't pay off. Your ideal customer in many ways should be a joy to serve a pleasure to serve, and ideally not so demanding of you or your staff 
that they're expensive to serve. And then finally, they should have growth potential. Ideally, your customer is a group that you can see growing or expanding. So let's take small businesses. BizHack primarily serves small businesses. You might say, well, small businesses uh, are shrinking, right? We're down almost a quarter. 75% uh, 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 of small businesses are still in, in business from six months ago. 25% uh, have permanently closed. So your total addressable market has shrunk. So you might say that's not a market with growth potential. That's one perspective. Another perspective is this kind of digital marketing, tactical and strategic knowledge has become more relevant because of the world we live in uh, post COVID where there you can't safely be in contact with people. So whether you're a B2B business who no longer can go to trade shows like Emerge Americas, or you're a B2C company whose storefront is empty because people don't feel safe going in there anymore, you need to use digital marketing in order to be able to survive and thrive. So though there are fewer small businesses, those that are still around need digital marketing more than ever. And then there's one other factor, which is uh, you know, the federal government is hopefully on the cusp of creating additional funds to help support small businesses in their work. And so there is growth potential in the ability to get grant funding to help support or defray the costs of this kind of training. So there is a way to think about whether the growth potential doesn't necessarily have to mean more numbers. So there are four ways to think about how to create your audience. And this is a, a wordy slide, but it really summarized by this. Where are they? Who are they? What do they do? And why do they do it? Where are they is geography. Where do they live? Um, you know, do they live in Canada? Do they live in the United States? Who are they? Um, that's more about demographics, age, gender, uh, class, culture, what do they do? Behaviors. Now, when you're thinking about behaviors in person, this could be like if you are a pet shop, you might want to look for people who go to the local dog park. That would be a great place for you to find your ideal customer. Um, if you're thinking about that online, now you're thinking about where do they congregate on Facebook? Which groups do they like? What are their... Um, the pages that they tend to spend time on? Are there trade associations that they tend to be affiliated with? The, uh, do they tend to, you know, are these people who visited your website? That's another kind of behavior that you can target. People who visited your website and then clicked on a button or spent more than a minute on the website. All of these are uh, actually categories that you can use for targeting people online. And then where Facebook really excels is psychographics, which is why do people do what they do? This is really about their interests and their personality. And psychography, psychographics, the why people do what they do, uh, those tend to be pretty much permanent. Like people's psychography doesn't change with time. And so if you can leverage, as we're going to talk about Facebook's tools to target people by psychographics and you get really good at identifying customers based on psychographics, you're gonna be very successful in terms of your online marketing. So, um, you know, Jane Moore talked about people who are adventurous, um, people who, um, uh, I'm just looking at some different ones. You know, um, Stephen talked about people who are guitar nerds, right? Those are examples of psychographics, right? People who are, uh, adventurous, who like luxury, who are gearheads. Um, those are personality traits that have been with them for their whole life that they're now applying uh, to their travel. They're applying to their guitar learning. Uh, and so that's really what psychographics is all about. So I want to bring this down to earth to a place that um, all of you probably would uh, recognize, which is Netflix. And I want to talk about how Netflix leveraged these insights about, you know, psychographics and, 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 and turned that into a new way to think about how to program television. So traditionally, television 
would talk about the Nielsen ratings, which is really about how many people in a key demographic, age uh, 18 to 34, are watching a certain show, right? And what share of all 18 to 34 year olds who are on TV are watching at that particular time. And that was how we measured audience and how we dis determined success. That is a demographic segmentation, age, gender. Netflix reinvented TV demographic, TV demos by talking rather about past viewing history and then using that to leverage it for predictions about future viewing history. So this is more about a behavioral targeting. What are they watching in the past? And then leveraging that to get a sense of interests or psychographic targeting, not age, not location. They basically had the insight that it doesn't matter if you're 30 or 70, if you watch the same things, you're likely to like similar new things. And the way they found that they could best earn attention is by resonating with customers' interests. And this all basically, at the, in the early days of Netflix, became about their recommended titles. So they were giving you recommendations based on your past viewing history. And here, now we're gonna lift the hood on how they actually were able to leverage data to do that. So the way Netflix does this is that they have identified 2,000 taste clusters. In other words, people with similar tastes tend to watch this set of programs. And you can see in the graphic that some of the taste clusters have names, a lot of the taste clusters do not. Um, and they all kind of merge and mix together. So you can see that Broadway musical fans have a little bit of an over, the people who like the cluster of movies uh, and shows related to Broadway musicals have uh, a little bit of an overlap with the comedy and drag cluster. Uh, and that there's also a little bit of an overlap with a different set of people who like sports. So these clusters are about what sets of programs these people with similar interests in this taste cluster tend to watch. And they've done this algorithmically by crunching you know, data from the viewing habits of millions and millions of people. And they've seen that these taste clusters, many of them don't even have a name. Like you look at it and you wouldn't be able to identify why people are watching this set of things, but customer behavior has suggested that they do. So I'll give you an example uh, of a taste cluster. Take the, the film Black Mirror. It's kind of like a 21st century Twilight Zone. I think it's uh, produced by the BBC. They found that people who love the Black Mirror, which is kind of a dystopian um, one-off set of um, little like mini movies, uh, also tend to like the movie, the TV show Lost, which is in the supernatural or extreme worlds cluster as well as the movie Groundhog Day, which is in the dark drama cluster. And so what they found is that if a member hasn't, oops, excuse me, um, if a member hasn't yet watched Black Mirror, but they've watched Shameless or Orphan Black and the OA, we can be relatively confident in suggesting Black Mirror to them. So that's what this is all about, is that if they like this set of things, they're likely to like this other thing. Now, just to bring this home for you, if you can identify a cluster of interests, TV shows, other qualities that your ideal customer likes, then you can say, if this person who likes this TV show, this um, you know, brand, this activity, they're very likely to like my product too. So your product is like Black Mirror in, in this example. You're looking for uh, characteristics to identify your ideal customer and to make them be that person who's more likely to, to do business with you. So the company Credo uh, is that your Netflix is not my Netflix. In other words, they, they, they adapt the product to the persona. So your experience of Netflix is personalized. And that's really where they've 
leveraged marketing insights to then innovate around audience identification. Another very concrete, very different example of how this can work in real life and have massive real world implications is Cambridge Analytica. This is the firm you may recall that helped get President Trump reelected through leveraging of a ton of Facebook data. What they would call this effort is the constellation of interests. So what they were looking for were people who would be sympathetic to alt-right messaging and sympathetic to Trump's campaign. And what they did is they were looking for people, uh, looking for the constellation of interests that those people tended to have. One of the most surprising findings they had is that people who are sympathetic to uh, the alt-right and that kind of messaging tend to really like Adam Sandler movies. Now you might be, what the heck? That's not at all what I think of when I think of someone on the alt-right. And you, uh, the reason why is you're not thinking about them as a whole person. Everybody likes to laugh. Everybody likes funny movies. Not everybody likes the kind of juvenile guy meets girl, guy loses girl, guy gets girl back of an Adam Sandler movie. But it turns out that the folks on the alt-right tend to like that. Now, it can be a false positive. Not everybody who likes an Adam Sandler movie is necessarily in the alt-right. I, for instance, really enjoy Adam Sandler movies. I'm not partial to the alt-right. So what that means is you have some false positives if you just relied on the single interest of the Adam Sandler movie. You need to think about it as a constellation of interests. So another really strong predictor for being associated with the alt-right is if you are in favor of spanking, corporal punishment for children. And so if you have somebody who likes Adam Sandler movies and is in favor of spanking, that's a constellation of interests to very likely indicate uh, someone who'd be very amenable to an alt-right message. This is how you need to think about your marketing. This is how you're gonna find success in Facebook advertising, Instagram advertising, LinkedIn advertising. You need to identify what cluster, uh, uh, what taste clusters, what constellation of interests your ideal customer that you identified has. And I'm gonna now show you some tools to help you figure out how to do that. Now, I just wanna talk a little bit more about how a segmentation can yield some very surprising results. When the um, millennial marketing did a study segmenting millennials, they found that about one in three are what we stereotypically think of as the millennial, which is the hip ennial, the, the millennial who wants to change the world, is a little holier than thou, uh, you know, struggles sometimes with, um, uh, you know, following directions. Uh, they're, they're very, um, you know, very oriented in changing the world and very focused on that. Uh, that's the hip ennial, and they actually only represent about one in three millennials. In fact, millennial moms and then the old school millennial together are a larger segment of the population than the hip ennial. A lot of folks will tell me, I can't sell my product or service to millennials. And what they're really thinking about is to hip ennials, not to the entire millennial population. It's a very common mistake and something that you really want to avoid, which is you really want to avoid overgeneralizing about an age or a gender or a demographic, and you want to really focus uh, rather on psychographics and behaviors that will get you a much higher likelihood of finding your ideal target customer, regardless of age. We talked about this idea that if you try to segment uh, based on a criteria that's not findable, it's worthless to you. And when you're creating your target customer, you want to think about it in terms of a persona. A persona is like a, it's like an avatar. It's, it's a way for you to talk to a human being rather than to a cluster of interests. So one of the most effective ways to identify your ideal customer is to give them a name. One of the things that I tend to do is I like to actually name my avatars after actual customers that I've had. 
so that it makes it easier for me to visualize them and talk to them. Uh, and you can give them like a snazzy name, like one of my avatars is uh, Survivalist Sammy. Uh, another one is uh, Ambitious at Annie. Um, so, you know, the Survivalist is really more about um, coming to digital marketing out of necessity. Uh, Ambitious Annie is much more growth minded and she's more focused on coming to digital marketing as a way to advance her career and advance her business. So whether they come from an adversity mindset in the survivalist mode or a growth mindset in the, um, in the uh, ambitious Annie mode, you, that's the way for you to uh, begin to put like a human being behind the persona, behind the, the ideal customer. And doing that is through the creation of a persona. So we're gonna talk uh, as we go through some of these tools about the Facebook advertising campaign. And you'll see at the end that we um, show how the our audience targeting can be put together into a Facebook ad. And the reason that we start with Facebook ads is not because Facebook is necessarily the best or the only way for you to market your business, but we have found it's one of the best ways to learn how to market digitally. So Facebook acts in many ways in digital marketing like ballet does in dance. It's the foundation or that um, piano does when learning an instrument. Uh, it's a great place to learn your chords. And we have actually a guitar um, uh, expert and business owner. Um, and so Stephen, I'd be interested in whether um, you would agree that a great way to start learning music is on a piano. So when we're talking about Facebook, I just want to be really clear that we're not talking about boosted posts. We're talking about ads. The main difference between a boosted post and an ad is that, first of all, where you create it, it's created in a different part of Facebook and how you create it uh, is very different and what you can do with it looks different. And I'm going to talk to you about how that works. One of the main distinguishing features of an ad uh, is called the uh, call to action button or the learn more, uh, which it says learn more here. You can see that, that in a boosted post that doesn't exist. So first of all, let's talk about organic posts. Organic posts are posts that uh, are really just status updates. Uh, it, it's free of charge um, and you aren't necessarily gonna get fantastic results. It's not gonna necessarily reach that many people. And the reason why is because Facebook has made it more and more difficult uh, over time for you to actually reach your like or people who like and follow your page. In fact, the organic reach of the average Facebook post is less than 5% of your total audience. So if you have 100 people who've liked your page, fewer than five are gonna see it uh, on average. The other option is to boost. Now boosting is a way to basically turn back the clock on this graphic to take you from uh, five people, 5% uh, 5 of your audience to maybe 15 or 20%. But the truth is that you might not necessarily get great results from a post even if you boost it, it might not generate the kind of results you're looking for. And the reason why is because it's a clumsy instrument. If you're going to spend money on Facebook, we strongly re recommend that you don't boost, that you run ads and that you build those ads in what's called Facebook Business Manager. A number of you are not yet in Facebook Business Manager. One of the tools that we're going to show you here today requires you to create a Facebook Business Manager account. It's free. You just need to have a Facebook business page and a personal Facebook page in order to do it. But these are all the advantages in terms of audience targeting and other attributes that an ad has over a boost. And we definitely don't recommend that you boost posts when you have the ability to run ads. A lot of folks have felt that, um, you know, now is the time to hoard cash and they're right about that. But you got to take some bets. You, now is not the time to stay silent. Uh, as Bruce Barton, one of the fathers of modern advertising said, when times are good, you should advertise. When times are bad, you must advertise. Now is not the time to stay silent. So we're going to talk now about how you can identify some of the interests that your ideal customer might have. And we call this the but no one else would trick. 
When you're targeting people online, you want to think about a Goldilocks principle. You want to make sure that your targeting is specific, that it's not so broad that you're getting a lot of false positives or so narrow that you're actually targeting um, too few eyeballs to actually make a difference. So a way to think about this is if you are a pet food pet store and you want to find pet owners, it might be too broad for you to go to Hallover Park because half of the people who are there are you know, flying kites. A lot of the people there are boating. So Hallover Park, one of the big parks we have here in South Florida, it's like too broad. You're not going to find enough dog owners and cat owners to make that uh, worth your while. Too narrow might be that if you were to go to a, um, you were to stand next to a, uh, like one of those little stations where you can get the doggy bag. Now we know that anybody that grabs a doggy bag very likely is walking a dog, but there might not be enough traffic by that little station in order to justify it. The perfect middle ground is the dog park, right? So do you see how a park, a general park is too broad? You know, a little station is too narrow. It's the dog park where you're going to have enough volume that it would probably be worth you marketing your services there. Same idea with targeting on Facebook or digitally. So let's do a thought experiment together. Let's imagine that you own a golf retail store. You sell golf clubs, you sell golf uh, equipment, you sell golf balls, and you're looking to find people who are looking to buy, to buy golf equipment. Um, those of you who haven't done this before, jump in the chat and let me know what interests would you target if you were trying to get people to buy your golf clubs? So what things would you be looking for? What cluster of interests, what taste cluster, what constellation of interests would you be looking for to find somebody who might be interested in buying a golf ball or a golf club? So go ahead and put some of your ideas in the chat, everybody. What are some of the targeting criteria you would use to find people who are interested in golf? So cl uh, cl uh, golf club membership, excellent. Executives or retirees. Les uh, Rub talked about clothing. Business executives, business trade associations, right? So business people are likely to have the money and the interest in golf. Folks at convention centers. Uh, likes walking on grass. That might be a hole in the sock. I don't know how you're going to find people who like walking on grass, but I, Andre, I like the way you think. School golf coaches, less talked about people who like to travel. Excellent. So what we often hear is, um, <laughs> Terry, you've probably heard this before, is we often hear people will say things like the PGA, Tiger Woods. The problem is that Tiger Woods is a little bit like Adam Sandler. It's too broad. And so if you try to target people who like Tiger Woods, then you might risk wasting a lot of money on people who have no idea about or interest in golf. I'm not a golfer, but I love, I know who Tiger Woods is. I might even follow Tiger Woods travails in People Magazine. And so um, as Terry said, you really want to be focusing instead on Bubba Watson. And many of you are probably like Bubba who? And if you say Bubba who, that means you're not a golfer. Uh, and not likely to be someone who would be my ideal target customer as a golf retailer. Golf enthusiasts know that Bubba Watson is one of the greatest left-hand shot makers in the history of golf. He's also the kind of person that only people who really are into golf would know, or their spouses. So I want to do an exercise now with you where you share with me who your Bubba is for your industry, for your product or service. So, for instance... Um, Somebody who is interested in guitars would know what X is, let's say uh, Fender, but nobody else would. So Fender is a brand of, uh, of guitars. Um, so a, golf, a, a guitar enthusiast would know what Fender is, but nobody else would. Um, tell me more Bubba type uh, identities. So Les talked about property managers. Um, what I would need to know is a property manager would know what X is, but nobody else would. So give me kind of uh, a sense of what industry and what, um, 
what interest they might have. So somebody interested in international development would have an interest in adventure travel, but nobody else would. Um, it's possible that folks who are interested in adventure travel, Carrie, could uh, be a false positive. So, you know, some adventure travelers might not also be interested in, in international development. It may be a part of the cluster of interests, just like Adam Sandler was, but it's not going to help you immediately identify them. Um, people who are interested in marketing would know what ICP is, but no one else would. Uh, I'm interested in marketing. I don't even know what ICP is, so I like that one, Lucia. Um, people who are interested in luxury travel would know what the tail number is. I like that. I don't know what a tail number is. Um, Gretsch Guitars, uh, thank you for that. So people who are interested in guitars or guitar enthusiasts would know the brand Gretsch. It uh, has a couple extra letters in its name than mine, uh, G-R-E-T-S-C-H. Um, so, so Terry said, I struggle to find something for franchise ownership or businesses. We actually, you may recall, talked about this, um, when we spoke, which was a lot of the type of person, people who would be interested in owning a franchise, uh, have a sales background, specifically pharmaceutical sales. So somebody who is, has a pharmaceutical sales background is actually, that's kind of a bubba for you. That's a good way for you to identify somebody who would probably make for a good franchise owner. So um, the reason why is because people who are in pharmaceutical sales uh, understand uh, how to you know, stick with sometimes difficult sales processes. Uh, they are unafraid of getting out there and putting themselves in front of folks. Uh, they're highly trained on the sales piece, which is really important for an owner. So th that might become the way to profile your ideal uh, f future franchise owner. So that's an example of a Bubba. Now there's a tool that Facebook offers. This is that free tool that uh, I promised you in, in, the, in the presentation, and it's called Facebook Audience Insights. Facebook Audience Insights is inside of Business Manager, so it does require that you create a free Facebook Business Manager account. You just go to business.facebook.com to do that. You click on everyone, and so now what you're gonna do is you're gonna take all of the data that Facebook has collected on all three billion people in their database, and you're gonna then compare how people who have your specified interest relate to the average Facebook user. It's kind of crazy, but yes, they are giving you access uh, in, in, to data from all of their users. Um, and it's free of charge, no cost whatsoever. So let's talk about that pet shop I mentioned earlier. It's Eileen's pet shop. Eileen has noticed that she has two ideal customers, Chihuahua owners and Rottweiler owners. Well, she puts Chihuahua as an interest that's all she did, right? Uh, you, she said you indicated the United States because she does business in the U.S. And then she indicated an interest in Chihuahuas. Uh, and I recommend, by the way, when you get started, that you don't uh, go for your specific geography to start. Just start in the United States or Canada, wherever you are. And that way you'll be able to start narrowing it down because you'll see that in the entire United States, only 1 to 1.5 million people have indicated uh, an interest in chihuahuas. So it's not a huge audience. So you don't wanna narrow it to a geography. It might be too few an audience to get meaningful data out of Facebook Audience Insights. And what you'll see in that red circled area is the gray line is people on Facebook who are age 45 to 54, 55 to 64, et cetera. And then the blue lines are people on Facebook who've indicated an interest in chihuahuas who fit into those categories. And you'll see that compared to the average Facebook user, the person with the interest in chihuahuas tends to trend older, 45 and above. Now let's look at that same data, but for Rottweilers. First of all, you'll see that Rottweilers is a larger audience, 3.5 to 4 million people. And you'll see it's a significantly younger audience. People who like Rottweilers tend to be 34 years and below. So it's the same dog food that you're selling, the same uh, pet store that you're running to ideal customers 
and they couldn't be more different. One is young, the other is old. Let's dig in a little deeper. There's this thing called page like in Facebook Audience Insights. When you click on page likes, you now see what pages are people who like chihuahuas more likely to be a fan of, to, to, to follow. And here is that list. And I always look at, when I looked at this list, some of these are kind of not surprising. Um, people who indicate an interest in chihuahuas tend to like the place, the page, I love Chihuahuas Club. Okay, makes sense. But what's interesting is Norbert. What is Norbert? Well, I, you can just click on Norbert and it takes you to Norbert's Facebook page. And I wanna introduce you to the cutest puffball of a dog you've ever seen who has the ability to give high fives. His name is Norbert the dog. And Norbert the dog is a influencer. He has millions of followers, apparel, uh, an entire business has been built by Norbert's owner around Norbert the dog, which is some um, kind of mixed breed dog that nobody really knows exactly who he is, but he is dang cute for sure. So essentially Norbert is a dog influencer and Norbert is your uh, ideal, is one of your Bubba's. It's one of the ways to identify your ideal customer. Now let's do the same exercise with page likes, but let's look at Rottweilers and you'll see that they, first of all, Rottweiler owners really love pit bulls. That's a good insight. But when you get down a little further, you get to this thing called psychotic, which sounds about the opposite of Norbert. And in this case, psychotic is a media brand. It's a TV show, it's apparel. It's basically like a way to say that you're a, a badass and it's about the opposite of Norbert. The point here is that you're the same store targeting two different sets of folks with two different sets of dog owners. And can you see now that it is suicidal for you to try to advertise to dog owners, that that's too broad? The messaging for a Rottweiler owner is gonna be so different than the messaging for a Chihuahua owner, but both of them are your ideal customer. That's how power, how this data can be so powerful to allow you to not only understand who your ideal customer is, but what their interests are and how to target them online. Now, Google has a set of amazing tools that you can use to help identify those folks as well. So first of all, you might recall that the interest in the group of people who like Chihuahuas on Facebook is much smaller than Rottweilers, but when it comes to actual search volume, people typing Chihuahua into Google, uh, you can see that Chihuahua is actually far more popular than Rottweiler in Google. So what can attribute this difference, this almost doubling? Uh, in one case, Chihuahuas, people who like Chihuahuas are about half the size of people who like Rottweilers on Facebook, but double the search volume on Google. My explanation for this is that because Chihuahua owners tend to trend older, they're not as engaged on Facebook as the younger set of Rottweiler owners. Remember that data from Facebook is Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, it's all of their data in one spot. And so uh, Chihuahua owners are on Google though, everybody uh, uses Google for searching, and it probably this probably means that the overall population of Chihuahua lovers is larger than the Rottweiler lover, but more of the Rottweiler lovers are on Facebook than on Google. So you can see how with just a couple simple search terms using these free tools, uh, this is trends.google.com. Google Trends is a way for you to uh, compare the search volume, relative search volume of two different terms. One of my uh, favorite ones to put in here is you put in like, two uh, of your favorite uh, actors or two of your favorite musicians. Uh, I recently did um, Kim Kardashian and um, Taylor Swift. And uh, to my horror and dismay, Taylor Swift is far less popular than Kim Kardashian. So here are five ways to use Google Trends. One is you can use it to measure the popularity of your Bubba. You can see you know, how many people really like uh, you know, Bubba Watson versus Tiger Woods or Bubba Watson versus another golfer. It allows you to get a sense of the relative size of your market. It communicate, it allows you to communicate in the language of your customers. For instance, 
Uh, I use digital marketing and online lead generation more or less interchangeably. So you could put those two terms into Google Trends and see which one actually has a greater search volume and maybe trend towards using that term more. You can use it to track trends and seasonality. So you'll see uh, that um, there might be some seasonality to the data. Uh, so this data, for instance, is pretty consistent um, year over year. Uh, but you can see that there is like a spike over here and it's trending up here as well. So you can try to see if there might be some seasonality to your data um, that might that you can maybe capitalize on your marketing campaigns. And then you can add this trends data into client proposals. This is a, a really nifty, easy to use way for you to upgrade your client proposals and to allow you to really impress perspective customers with your acumen. There's another tool that is called Google Keyword Planner. And Google Keyword Planner requires you to have an ads account in Google, with you know, Google's uh, version of Business Manager, uh, Google Ads Manager. Google Ads Manager is also free. Keyword Planner is another free tool. And it basically allows you to see if you put in one keyword, what other keywords are people searching for that are similar. So for instance, I put Chihuahua in, and Chihuahua, it told me, is part of these broader searches around dog breed, toy dog, pet dog, and pet breed. Ah, now I just noticed by looking at that that there's two ways to talk about dogs. You can talk about a dog or you can talk about a breed. So there's another word that I can add to my search engine optimization, make sure that I'm bidding on those keywords, make sure that it is appearing on my website, et cetera. And then you see, we put in Ch Chihuahua, and then you can see some of the other ways that Chihuahua is being used. So for instance, Chihuahua is often misspelled as Chihuahua, like, uh, like Wawa, my favorite uh, convenience store. Uh, there's also Chihuini, uh, which I guess is like a term of endearment for Chihuahuas. Um, turns out that Chihuini is actually a really popular term. Uh, the competition on it is low. And so what that might mean is it might be worth it to you to actually uh, bid on Chihuini as a term because that's maybe your ideal customer. So Chihuini might actually be your bubba. That word Chihuini might be your way of identifying your ideal customer. So that's how this can be very, very powerful, is it shows you now what are the terms that your ideal customer tends to use. Another really powerful tool from Google is called Related Search. I'm sure you guys have noticed that if you put in um, a term into Google, uh, search bar, it then automatically gives you related searches and it kind of does it in real time. So if you're interested in figuring out who is Norbert, you'll see that Norbert the dog is the number one Norbert out there, but there's also Norbert from Harry Potter. Uh, there's also, I think, a Norbert that is a, uh, a dragon. So there are a lot of different Norberts out there. Um, and then when you actually hit return on your search, at the bottom of the search results, it gives you this box called searches related to who is Norbert. And it says like, what breed is Norbert the dragon? And so this is a way for you to um, get what are called like negative keywords. So you wanna make sure that you don't wanna get people who are interested in Norbert the dragon or Norbert, Norbert from Harry Potter. You only want people who are interested in Norbert the dog. Um, it also will give you lot, tons of other insights about peop, what people's behavior in search is. So this is a, all, all of this search is a form of behavioral targeting and the behavior is people typing into the Google search menu. These are free tools, guys, really simple to use. I mean, none is simpler than this. Just go to Google and you can get tons of really amazing data just from putting in a couple words into their search. There are a couple other free tools I wanted to highlight. One is called Answer the Public. Answer the Public allows you in a very convenient way to find searches related to your keyword. So for instance, um, I put in pet store and then you can see that it gave me all these different searches around pet store. Which pet store, what pet store, who pet store, uh, when is pet store. And so for instance, I just pulled which and it created this. 
which pet store is cheaper, which pet store is the best. So this really gets you deep into the mind of your ideal target customer and what they're looking for online. And then this can help you identify what answers you should give to them. Uh, Robert asked if you'll get the slides from this presentation. Absolutely, for everybody who registered and gave an email address uh, in this Zoom, we're gonna be sending you these slides after the fact. Thank you for asking that. So another tool is called Uber Suggest. It's by this guru, Neil Patel. Neil Patel is a good uh, marketer, Bubba. In other words, people who know marketing know Neil Patel, but not too many other people do. I'm curious of you guys in the group, uh, throw in the chat, have you ever heard of Neil Patel? Uh, Neil Patel is a fabulous resource to you, but I'm curious if any of you guys have heard of him. Uh, Sarah says yes, Ava says yes, Marina says yes, Patricia says yes, Steve says no. Um, so you can kind of see the folks who are a little bit nerdier and deeper into the marketing world know who Neil Patel is. Um, I think that Neil Patel is more of a bubba for marketing people uh, than um, like say Gary Vaynerchuk. But Gary Vaynerchuk is more like Tiger Woods at this point. Like he's, he's a guy who fills stadiums. Neil Patel is a dude who writes blog posts that people really enjoy and, and creates tools that are really useful. Um, and Marina has mentioned uh, his... Um, his podcast. Feel free, Marina, to throw uh, the uh, link to that podcast in here. So what you do is you just put Pet Store in the Uber Suggest, and they give you uh, incredible uh, data around the difficulty uh, of winning that word in search engine optimization. In other words, can you get people who search that word? Can you get your website to show up? Uh, how difficult is it uh, if you pay for that word? What is the cost per click? Uh, what is the searcher's age range? Amazing data. Um, and then they even give you content ideas, which I think is incredible, which is um, these are all different articles that include the word pet store in them. Um, and it's an amazing way for you to come up with ideas for your own blog post. I wanted to um, give you a little bonus. Uh, when you're thinking about audience targeting, part of what you wanna do is retarget people who have interacted with you and your website and your social media. So this is an important concept in digital marketing. One of the most important behaviors you would be looking for in marketing is whether they have interacted with you online, right? If somebody comes to your store let's say you're a storefront, if someone comes to your store, that's a great indicator of interest in you and your brand. And so that's what retargeting is. It's a digital version of that. Now you might ask, uh, how do you um, capitalize on these folks? And there are incredible technology tools that have been developed by Facebook and Google and others uh, known as the Pixel that allow you to retarget people who've interacted with you online. The reason why this is really important is that only 4% of the people who visited your Facebook or website are actually ready to become customers. Retargeting is a way to keep them, uh, keep you top of mind and to get, make it more likely um, for you to actually get them to uh, the point where they're going to want to be a customer with you. So let's answer the question, what is retargeting? So let's answer the question, what is retargeting? Retargeting is a way to show people uh, who've shown interest in you but haven't yet converted. They're basically a way to take people who are unknown to you and to make them known. Um, and you can retarget people who visited your website by pixeling your website and connecting that pixel to Facebook or Google. Pixel is just a fancy term for a little bit of code that allows data from your website to go to the targeting gurus at Facebook and Google. That's one of the most powerful ways for digital marketing. Amazon is great at retargeting. Have you ever noticed that if you search on something in Amazon, that ad, uh, whether it's for a bicycle or red shoes or a speaker, appears all over the internet following you around, that's retargeting. Another great example of retargeting is TripAdvisor. If you uh, indicate that you're interested in a trip uh, on TripAdvisor, you know, putting in, you know, pricing out some, some, some flights or, or hotels, they will then follow you around with discounts for that uh, trip. The way that you retarget inside of Facebook is through something called custom audiences. It's actually relatively, it's harder to explain than it is to do. You just have to go to the 
uh, audiences tab inside of business manager, go into custom audiences, and then you can retarget people based on all of these criteria. One of the most po powerful forms of custom audiences is called the customer file, custom audience. Uh, in, the, in this case, uh, you can actually upload the contact information, name, email address, phone number of your customers, and then Facebook or Google will match those two advertising profiles and you can advertise to just folks who are matched by your customer list. Google has a, um, a customer match is what they call it, but it's the same idea. One thing you'll notice, guys, is Google calls it remarketing. Facebook calls it retargeting. Uh, Google calls it customer match. Facebook calls it customer file. This is why we like to start with Facebook because it's both easier to learn. The concepts are a little bit portrayed a little bit more simply. And frankly, the main concepts exist in Facebook have an ident identical analog in Google and not just Google, but TikTok. Um, LinkedIn, et cetera. So the, the big ideas uh, in digital marketing, the big innovations have been copied uh, uh, by all the major players. So the main differentiator, frankly, between Facebook and Google and some of the smaller players is just the size of the audience. Facebook has a much larger audience than, uh, and Google has a much larger audience than all the others. So I want to give you a case study of how to put the five pillars together. Meet Megan Hill. She's a ghostwriter and book editor. She had been a lawyer for many years and then pivoted to go into book writing. Um, she got a gig as a ghostwriter for a former Oprah author. And she said, you know what? I want to start my own business. Her only problem is that she had no website, no social media, and a tiny ad budget. Her solution was to advertise herself on Facebook. So the first thing that she decided to do is she picked her campaign objective. In her case, she picked lead generation. This is actually a lead form that appears directly inside of Facebook and allows you to collect contact information from people inside of Facebook. Then she targeted her ideal customer. Her ideal customer was somebody over age 35, because if they're going to be, uh, the, she called them the rich aspiring memoirist. They need to have enough life experience. She personally wanted them to be in the arts, entertainment, sports, or media industries because those are the areas that she's most interested in. And she also knows those are the areas where books tend to sell best. Um, sorry. Uh, she wanted to uh, identify folks who are interested in writing, but it turns out that writing is not the sort of thing that people indicate an interest on on Facebook. And so she used the closest proxy she could to writing, which is reading. And then she wanted to make sure that they had the money to pay for it. So this is a cluster of uh, interests that she used to target her customer. And here's the actual screen grab of how that targeting was translated into Facebook. One thing I want to point out is she's very interested in people who are interested in uh, reading, but there is no interest category called reading. She had to rather use Bubba's that are indicated an interest in reading, like Goodreads, which is a social network for readers, and The New Yorker, which is a magazine. So she used those to get at people interested in reading. And you can see that she also was able to uh, target uh, folks in the ho with household income in the top 5% of zip codes. Next, she had her irresistible offer. If you're gonna advertise on Facebook, you need to make sure that you're making people want to click. Her free irresistible offer in this case, uh, which is something that people would pay for, but that you're giving for free, was a 30 minute consultation to talk about publishing your book. And I think what really made this key is a lot of rich aspiring memoirists are wondering, do I use a traditional publisher or do I just self publish? For them, money is not really an object. And so she promised a consultation on the pros and cons of traditional versus self publishing. She really knew her ideal customer and that that was something that they were gonna respond to. So then she needed to create a video. Uh, we call, Facebook calls this a thumb stopping video. Facebook has an incredible free tool built inside a business manager called the Video Creation Kit. This video is really just a slideshow of a couple of images and words and it can take less than 30 minutes to create using this, these simple templates. There are other programs like Canva and Lumen5, L-U-M-E-N-5, 
that we also recommend for building thumb stopping videos. By thumb stopping, by the way, just means that if you're scrolling on Facebook, you stop and watch the video. That's a thumb stopping video. This was Megan's video. She used some stock photography. Honestly, it wasn't that special, but it got the job done. And then finally, you want to make sure that in your marketing text, you focus on how you're solving a customer pain. So for uh, Megan, she just needed 14 words, uh, helping people bring together their stories, uh, bring their stories to life on the written page. Her uh, offer was the free phone consultation. Her call to action, the action that she wanted people to take was to click over to the lead form by clicking learn more. And call to action is the critical final stage. The campaign objective, you identify what you want them to do. The call to action is the text you use to get them to do that thing, to take them on the next step of the customer journey. And I love the term, a lot of marketing terminology like remarketing and uh, other terms are completely terrible, but call to action is one that I think is really cool. So this was her ad. She uh, had the ad right there. It then took them to a lead form. And these were her results. She spent $430 on this campaign, uh, was able to generate 13 leads, 13 people filled out the lead form, seven of them became sales, and she was able to generate new client revenue with this one campaign uh, of more than $105,000. That's a 244x return on investment. In other words, for every dollar in ad spend, she was able to get new client revenue of $244. Uh, her video, Denise, was created using Lumen5, yes. And this is what Megan said to me afterwards. In just a few weeks, I built an online platform from scratch, launched a marketing campaign, and attracted enough clients to keep me busy for a year. And this is absolutely what we are all about here at BizHack. We champion the underdog so you can thrive. We want to make... Sorry, there's a somebody right outside my window right now. We champion the underdogs so that you can thrive. We wanna make sure that those businesses with limited budget, limited staff, limited time can still have a chance at growing their business using digital marketing. We wanna give you the chance to pick your clients, to grow your business uh, and to thrive despite this challenging environment. So um, I want to quickly wrap up uh, with talking about what's coming up next in BizHack Live. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about nine steps you can take to improve your presence on Google with the amazing Joe Laratro of Tandem Interactive. And then in two weeks from today, we're going to be celebrating our digital marketers graduation party. We're already starting to build up our season three of BizHack Live. The first one is on streamlined financials for startups something I think a lot of you guys will be really interested in. Um, and then we're gonna be talking about networking for business growth, how to turn contacts into sales. Uh, that's also in January of 2021. It's right around the corner. I did wanna alert those of you who are not up already participating that we do have a grant funded cash crash course that covers uh, in greater depth a lot of the stuff we're talking about here. It's open to any business. Uh, you can go to bizhack.com to sign up. Uh, we have more than a thousand folks from around the world registered, and we would love for you uh, to be a part of that. We also have just opened scholarship applications for our next five-week course. So Megan is an example of someone who went through our five-week course. It's an intensive program in online lead generation. It's uh, a total of 30 hours over five weeks. It includes 20 hours of class time like this, combined with one-on-one -on -one and group coaching to walk you through implementation of your ad on Facebook and then for other places. The scholarship program we've opened is to women-owned businesses and entrepreneurs of color. Uh, it's part of our giving back to the community during this time of need. We've given out more than $90,000 to 50 businesses who are part of the scholarship. It's at try.bizhack.com slash scholarship. Again, go to try.bizhack.com slash scholarship. These are partial scholarships that defray uh, a portion of the cost uh, of taking the course. Um, it's, uh, we're coming up uh, on January 25th is the start date of the new program. 
And then I wanted to talk uh, about one parting thought, which is we're right now living through a terrible crisis, a crisis that's actually getting worse before it will get better. This is going to be a really difficult winter for a lot of us business owners. And I want you to know that the Chinese term for crisis contains two characters. One is for danger and the other is for opportunity. And the danger is obvious. It's manifest. We're seeing a lot of small business death. We're seeing a lot of personal death. We're seeing many, many businesses struggling and going out of business. But at the same time, this is an opportunity. There is opportunity in crisis, an opportunity for you to reinvent your business, to reinvent yourself. And I want to just say, uh, as a parting word, grasp the opportunity. Thank you so much to Emerge Americas for sponsoring us today. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I really appreciate your time, your interest. And I hope you have an amazing rest of your week. Thanks so much, everybody.